Hi, thank you very much for inviting me today. Uh, Justin brought me out here a couple years ago and I had a wonderful talk to the ecology department and it's good to be back to tell you about some follow-up research um, we've done since then on biofuels uh, fit, fitting in nicely with the idea of uh, valuation of ecosystem services. Um, there's no doubt that we're searching for petroleum alternatives uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, certainly our supply volumes with peak oil and such are, are in danger, the stability of supply, um, international conflict. Uh, we've had record prices lately come down um, a bit, but anyone who's pulled up to the pump in the last couple of weeks knows that they're creeping up again. Uh, of course, greenhouse gas emissions, and we are overwhelmingly dependent upon oil for our transportation needs, uh, well over 95%, and you can see some figures here of our total energy use and the greenhouse gas consequences uh, of that. Uh, we're looking to biofuels as a means of addressing uh, not one, not two, not three, but all of these different um, uh, problems that I listed earlier. We're looking for biofuels to help us with energy independence. Uh, for instance, um, the, there's a bumper sticker here on top. I uh, pulled it from uh, Clean Air Choice, a, a pro-ethanol uh, group, uh, saying 85% less foreign oil. So I'll, I'll return to that statement here a little later. Uh, we're also looking for biofuels to be a green alternative, not simply wean us from oil, but also to help us uh, uh, mitigate climate change, um, to reduce air pollution. So these are some, uh, uh, some pro-ethanol uh, and, and biodiesel um, uh, advertisements that have been put forth in that respect. Of course, there are growing concerns over biofuels. Um, we're learning more and more through our life cycle analyses the, uh, the consequences, the upstream consequences, the downstream consequences of transitioning from a fossil fuel economy to a renewable economy. And there are going to be some serious pains in doing so. Uh, work here uh, that I'll talk about in a little bit uh, speaks to one of the cryptic um, uh, impacts of biofuel production, uh, namely taking land uh, from uh, current agricultural food production, converting that to energy use. We've, we've linked our energy in our food markets, and there are going to be some serious consequences of doing that. Uh, for quite some time, the, the controversy over ethanol, uh, corn ethanol in particular, has focused on the idea of net energy. Do you get out more energy from ethanol than you put into making it. Um, this is a, a, a figure here showing the, the methodology of the life cycle assessment that go into uh, producing uh, ethanol in, into renewable fuels. Uh, and, and for the most part, um, you see it all the way on the right of the table there, um, uh, most researchers have found that you do get out more net energy than you put in uh, to the making of ethanol. Um, and this is a debate that has gone on for quite some time. I've put up um, two abstracts here, uh, both from science. Uh, gas a hall does it, or does it not produce uh, positive net energy, and then ethanol can con contribute to energy and environmental goals. And I'll just point out the copyright dates of those two articles, uh, 1979 to 2006. So th this debate is, has been raging now, uh, well now for 30 years at least. Um, but in many ways, it's a, it's a red herring uh, debate. I mean, this is, a lot of it comes back to thermodynamics. You can never really get out more energy than you, you put into a system. Uh, the question is, what are, we, what are we truly doing here? We're, we're converting energy in one usable form to another usable form. So what I've done here is taken the, um, taking the net energy balance of corn ethanol and have translated it simply from uh, a megajoule per megajoule basis to the forms of energy that go into and out of the process. Uh, the, the deep green bar is the output uh, of, in ethanol itself. The light green bar is the co-product, which is a, a, a food, um, an animal feed that comes out of corn ethanol production. And then you see the dark blue bar representing natural gas, the light blue bar being electricity uh, primarily from coal, and the pink bar uh, being petroleum. And so what we really have with corn ethanol is 
a means of converting natural gas into, into a liquid fuel. And, um, and, and the natural gas is used primarily in distillation of ethanol and also in the production of nitrogenous fertilizers. Um, most initial studies have concluded that corn ethanol emits less greenhouse gases than gasoline. So if you look at all the production stages uh, of, uh, uh, of corn ethanol, you find that the reduction is about 20% uh, from the life cycle production of gasoline. So when you're producing gasoline, somewhere around, every time you burn a gallon of gasoline, you're emitting about 24, 25 pounds of CO2. About 20 of that is directly at the ta tailpipe and about four or five are upstream emissions from producing that gasoline. Uh, corn ethanol is somewhat lower. Uh, those, those engineering life cycles, though, did not take into account the effects of land use change. So if you're taking land out of agricultural production uh, for energy production, you are going to increase uh, commodity prices, which is going to have global consequences of land use change as a, as a consequence. Uh, there's been a lot of criticism. Why didn't we see this earlier? Why, 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 why did it have to be early 2008 when two major papers came out that pointed this out? Well, you're going to miss land use change if you're doing an energy accounting of biofuels. You're only, only going to see it if you're looking at carbon. And, and, and so it really it, it simply was not part of the equation in the, initial, um, in the initial studies. So all the focus on net energy really blocked us from seeing the real world consequences of increased biofuel production. So now we have an environmental metric that we're looking at. Uh, we have um, much, uh, it's a much more serious situation. And in fact, uh, this indirect land use change and its consequences are actually codified into law now. Uh, the Energy Independence and Security Act uh, requires that all direct and indirect emissions, including from land use change, be incorporated into these calculations. And, I'll, I'll, and, and if, you've, if you've opened the paper recently, if you've seen Sunday's uh, New York Times, there's a really good editorial uh, on this as well. Um, but carbon's not the only story. And what I've done here is I pulled a slide from the National Renewable Energy Lab that shows uh, the trade-offs in air quality uh, from production of different fuels, um, uh, a, a production of cellulosic ethanol compared to uh, gasoline. And we see that although there are lower greenhouse gas emissions with cellulosic ethanol, the total emissions of NOx, uh, an air pollutant, are much, much higher. So, so we, when we start looking at different environmental metrics of production, uh, we see that there are definitely going to be trade-offs. And it's our job as people who are interested in, in implementing policies that will, um, uh, th that will allow us to make that transition to renewable fuels to understand what these trade-offs are. And ultimately, we're looking at this question of are biofuels better for society than the fossil fuels they displace? They have to be cheap. They have to have better environmental consequences, better social consequences. And we might also wonder eventually who benefits by this transition and by how much. There's gonna be some, some social justice and equity questions as well. So what I'm going to do for the, for the rest of the talk is discuss a paper that uh, we published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences uh, in February of this year, where we tried to put some dollar values on two major environmental consequences, life cycle consequences of um, of biofuel production. So if we're going to make this, um, uh, if we're going to make the, uh, answer the question of if biofuels are a good deal for society, we need to look both at the direct costs of production uh, plus the external cost uh, that, that we're focusing on certainly in, in, in this uh, uh, seminar today. Um, we need to look at the external costs associated with producing and using gasoline and compare that to any alternatives that we might um, that might be possible. So we focused on greenhouse gas emissions and emissions of fine particulate matter, uh, PM 2.5, which is the uh, w which is far and away the air pollutant with the greatest uh, economic damage uh, potential. Um, a, a, a recent study found that about 90% of all of all human health damage is due to PM 2.5. So we're really really focusing on the important one here. 
Um, consider, we're going to consider a billion gallon increase, a marginal increase in ethanol, or an energy equivalent amount of gasoline. Uh, the scenarios we looked at uh, were increase of uh, uh, simply gasoline um, or corn ethanol produced using uh, four different sources of, uh, of heat and power at the facility. So either natural gas, coal, uh, or corn stover. So using uh, the husks and cobs of corn to power the ethanol facility. And we threw in another scenario, which was an advanced natural gas scenario, in which we looked at massive industry improvements in the conversion technologies and also in corn yields and nitrogen use efficiency of corn. And then we compared this to cellulosic ethanol produced using four different feedstocks, uh, corn stover, uh, switchgrass, a diverse prairie, or miscanthus. And you can sort of, it, corn stover is a residue that's produced as a, as a byproduct of corn production. You have to throw on some more nutrients to, to get, if you're going to be harvesting corn stover. Uh, the diverse prairie and miscanthus scenarios are, are almost like a sensitivity test on the switchgrass. So for prairie, we assume equivalent yield to switchgrass, but with no fertilization, uh, no nitrogen fertilization. And miscanthus, we assume the same amount of nitrogen fertilization as switchgrass, but higher yields. Um, just to put up here really quickly the difference in that we're talking about in from corn ethanol production to cellulosic ethanol production. Uh, corn ethanol production uses the starch of uh, the the corn kernel, uh, which the starches are broken down into their basic sugars, which are fermented and eventually distilled to give us ethanol. Cellulosic ethanol, uh, cellulose is of course just sugars, uh, same as starch, but linked together slightly differently. Uh, those can be uh, broken down the, and converted to ethanol. The lignin portion, the woody portion of the plant uh, can be burnt to provide heat and power to the, um, to the process and perhaps even enough power, excess electricity that can be sold to the grid to offset uh, fossil electricity production. Um, our methodology is, is as follows. Uh, we uh, took our initial uh, food, fuel production and use parameters, um, uh, ran it through the GREET model from Argonne National Labs here, the best available model for life cycle analysis of uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions uh, from different fuels. Um, greenhouse, uh, we, we included a land use change analysis. We assumed that the all additional fuel was produced on CRP land. Uh, so, so either higher prices are going to require the conversion of CRP land to corn ethanol, or you're going to be able to convert that CRP land in a way that's consistent with um, uh, maintaining its ecosystem services and, in, 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 say, prairie restoration uh, to biofuel production. Um, the, the left side of this is the methodology we use to eventually arrive at the cost of life cycle greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we tracked greenhouse uh, gases of CO2, N2O, and, and methane, um, uh, applied a uh, carbon damage cost valuation to that, uh, social cost of carbon, uh, multiply those two values, give us the total cost of emissions. For, uh, for emissions of PM2.5, uh, we had to go through a much more rigorous process because Unlike CO2 emissions, which end up in the atmosphere and it doesn't matter where you emit them, where you emit the species of PM2.5 uh, matters. Uh, PM2.5 is, is either primary uh, fine particulate matter emitted directly from combustion or it can form from the atmospheric inter interaction of NOx, SOx, and ammonia. Uh, Greet and, and our model includes a number of uh, stages in the life cycle of ethanol, so anywhere from land use change to production of fertilizer, to transport, uh, to fer uh, fermentation, distillation steps, sales, and combustion. Uh, for gasoline, uh, very similar, everything from exploration and extraction of crude oil uh, to refinery emissions to sales and combustion. And on the greenhouse gas side, when we uh, take a uh, social cost of carbon of $120 uh, per ton, we see the, the following um, uh, we see the following results. That compared to gasoline, uh, corn ethanol as it's produced today, which is primarily that natural gas bar on the left, 
really has no uh, advantage um, in cost compared to gasoline itself. And across the board, uh, corn ethanol shows no major advantage um, unless you start looking at tremendously advanced scenario of, of natural gas power and, and improvements in agriculture uh, or the use of biomass uh, corn stover here. Uh, but uh, cellulosic ethanol across the board uh, shows massive improvements and, and massive uh, savings in, in costs uh, from the release of greenhouse gases. Uh, the, something I've already talked about here, because of the nature of uh, fine particulate matter, the, the formation and exposure, um, we need to account for uh, where emissions occur. And, and really, for, for most of the services and, and that we're going to be talking about, uh, location will matter. Uh, greenhouse gas is really the exception rather than the rule. So the methodology that I'm talking about here uh, can be applied to all sorts of other effects as well. Um, so we needed to take the GREET model, which gives us emissions by stage. So where, you know, where in the life cycle does it occur? Does it occur as a, as a, from a running a truck or at the refinery? And we needed to map on geographic uh, uh, data onto that. So we needed to uh, account for uh, all the following things, such as the areas where fertilizer is produced, uh, the areas that would be uh, farmed, lo the locations of biorefineries, where ethanol is produced, where it's consumed. Same thing with gasoline. We need to look at areas where crude oil is extracted, where it's transported, where refineries are located, and where the final product is used. And, um, and these are the uh, results showing the air quality impacts of of PM 2.5. Um, we see on the top left is uh, gasoline. Um, Showing, showing, of course, the California uh, uh, basin, uh, their uh, tremendous impact. This is a function both of the amount of gasoline that's used and the specific air quality. And when you look at corn ethanol, you, you see that uh, from the use stage, you have both California is certainly lighting up in all those areas as well, but you see a lot more impact in Midwest area and Corn Belt area as well. You can, you can really see the, the impact of the upstream emissions, the production steps. And in cellulosic ethanol production, you can even see an improvement in many areas. Um, in California, you see that improvement because of the uh, sale of electricity, offsetting fossil fuel use. Um, as, as well as some improvements uh, from tailpipe emissions, uh, lower SOX emissions from uh, use of ethanol. Uh, and so we, we take these, uh, these, physical, um, uh, uh, these physical maps and, and map on uh, population density and exposure. Uh, we looked at the following health effects of PM2.5. Uh, this, this one health effect of premature mortality, a particularly serious one, uh, accounts for about 90% of the total damage cost of, of PM2.5. And we see the following results, uh, looking very similar to what we had before, but in all cases, uh, even with massive improvements in the industry, corn ethanol shows no improvement over gasoline. However, PM2.5 uh, certainly is no worse than gasoline, uh, could perhaps even be slightly better uh, overall. Um, so, so we add these two together, and we get a fairly good snapshot of what the, the um, air pollution impacts are of, uh, of producing and using these different fuels. Uh, and, and just very briefly, that, that, that sort of sums up that paper, but, but uh, I'll show you some preliminary data here where we've taken these external costs and have, have combined them with direct production cost numbers for some of the scenarios that we talked about before. So this really starts to get the question of what's in the best interest of society uh, to develop. Um, we, we, for this, uh, used uh, commodity prices of, as given for inputs of production. We used uh, gasoline uh, rack prices. I'll show you here. Um, we, for cellulosic biomass feedstocks, uh, which we don't currently produce large amounts of these, uh, we had to um, uh, figure out what, the, uh, uh, what it would take to pay farmers to make it worthwhile for them to, to farm this and, and produce it. And I'm going to show you, um, show you estimates here from 2005 before we had 
uh, large amounts of corn devoted to um, uh, devoted to ethanol production, and then 2008 prices, where uh, input prices, both on the fossil side and the um, uh, fossil side and, and the corn side, were much higher. Uh, so 2005, using then current cellulosic uh, conversion technology, um, and gas prices were fairly low then, as were uh, corn prices. Uh, we, we see the following setup. Certainly, even though the extern, uh, external costs of cellulosic ethanol are much lower, uh, the, the, the full cost at that time uh, much higher. So I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to flip through these somewhat quickly. Uh, 2008 here with uh, current cellulosic conversion technology, uh, things certainly start to, lo to look much better. We're getting in, in the range of gasoline, uh, starting to look better than corn ethanol. Um, and then with state-of-the-art uh, technology for cellulosic conversion efficiency, we're getting to the point where we're actually uh, even better than uh, in total cost, lower than gasoline here. Um, in, in all these, we can, we can see the relative total um, impact of the external costs versus uh, the direct costs. And, and just to point, flip through these couple here of 2005 and 2008, you can see the tremendous difference in, um, in direct cost production now that we have impacted our corn markets as much as we have by using a third of our cor corn for production. Uh, so in, in the future, we're looking to expand the range of fuels that we consider, even to look at uh, the use of electricity and how, uh, for, for transportation, how that impacts the bottom line. Uh, expand the set of externalities we consider. We're, we're, we might do ozone right now. Uh, we're adding that to the mix. Um, just the, I've always wondered about water and, and how to put that in, but the last seminar gave me a great idea of how we can start to uh, by, by valuing the increase in productivity from increased organic uh, co um, content of soil to, to add that in as well. Um, we're considering issues of environmental justice, who's benefiting uh, from this and who's losing out. Um, adding some um, improvements to our model to make it a temporal model as well as a spatial model. And last but not least, do the comparison to conservation and efficiency. And I'll, I'll just end with two of my favorite slides. Um, that, that speak to this point. Uh, these are the, were the three largest biofuel producers in 2007, um, US, EU, and Brazil, and what we actually did in terms of offsetting our total gasoline use. This, this does not include um, uh, energy production that went into making these fuels. These are, these are just uh, gross amounts of, of fuel produced. And you can see the difference here in the U.S. Of, of how much fuel we use versus Brazil that has two-thirds of the population we do. Uh, tremendous difference in area. Uh, Brazil is by no means, uh, it's, it's been said, uh, energy independent. It's by no means weaned from, from fossil fuels for transportation by any means. They actually produce less ethanol than we do, but they use a lot less total transportation fuel. And they also have a transportation system that's much more closely reflecting uh, the European Union's that's more heavily diesel-based uh, than ours is. Uh, so so um, interesting to point those out. And then on, on the conservation efficiency side as well, we look at, um, uh, these are uh, some graphs, I, I think, uh, from, from EPA, uh, showing the, how fuel economy really has not improved here uh, since about 1980, 1985. And it's not because we don't have better technology by any means. When we look at the uh, zero to 60 time of our vehicles, or a measure of engine power, we see tremendous improvement. Uh, and that has been used up by heavier and heavier vehicles. So it's, uh, so I mean, what's, what's the best way of, of getting ourselves out of this problem? Well, we already have the, the, we have the technology, right? I mean, that, that, that's available. We just need to apply it in ways that are uh, truly, uh, uh, truly effective. And so this is another thing that we're going to be comparing to our numbers that we've already uh, devised. Uh, with that, I need to thank a number of people at the University of Minnesota, um, uh, Hong Kwa at, at Argonne, uh, uh, who worked very closely with this us on this and Lindsay Ludwig and uh, James Newman at, um, at uh, Industrial Economics in Boston who helped out as well. So thank you very much.